Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Enrique, which, and I'm an addict and an alcoholic. Hi. Hello. Um, NDK stands for Nicole Diane Christina, and I tell you that because it's a nice reminder for myself of why I am here. Um, ever since I remember, can remember, I've always wanted to be someone different, and I've gone through many identity crises, which results in the three different names, um, and NDK encompasses the whole of who I am today. Um, let's see. Um, so I am an addict and an alcoholic. It doesn't matter what I'm using. It's the obsession of the mind and the allergy of the body, and it transfers from one thing to another. And while alcohol is a big a part of my story, it was not when I came into the rooms, and so it took me a little while to figure out why I was here. I came into the rooms in 2017, January 1st, and I've been in and out of recovery. And as I said before, I have 12 days now, and I think what's changed is I am now here for myself. Before, I tried quitting because my father always warned me that we were that alcoholism runs in our family. I quit because society was telling me that I should be sober. I quit because I work with young children. I quit, you know, for many different reasons. But I finally, through being in the rooms, from being here, understood and understand why I want to quit and that I do have a problem. When I first came into the rooms, I didn't realize that this was a spiritual program. I just knew that where I was, it was going to get worse, and so I wanted to stop it before I hit any big physical bottoms. When I came in, I still had my job, I still had a home, I still had my car, no DUIs, no trouble with the law, but my emotional sobriety was definitely very far down the drain, and so I'm very grateful that I found these rooms when I did, and then I've stayed. Um, so when I first came into the rooms, um, you know, the steps mentioned God and I was raised Christian and I believed until I had a reason not to believe. And the reason I didn't believe or had reason not to believe was because I had a lot of questions and nobody could answer them to my contentment. I just didn't understand. Nobody could ask, answer and when I asked more questions, it made people upset. So I just learned not to ask questions to keep my mouth shut. So when I first came into the rooms, I didn't really believe in God. I knew that there was something bigger out there. And when people told me, you know, to find something that was bigger than myself that I understood, I struggled with that. I really struggled. And, you know, I wanted to believe that something bigger was out there. And I think I did no, something bigger was out there. I just didn't believe that it was going to help me. And, you know, I think it took me a long time to understand that it could help me. But, you know, they used to say God is love, and I didn't really know what love meant and what it looked like and, you know, how it could help me. And this, the phrase, you know, we'll love you until you love yourself really stood out to me and took a while, but, you know, I'm starting to get there. Um, but, you know, for me, it was just the willingness to be open to finding something that would help me. And many people say, you know, it's, you know, the gift of drunk, our group of drunks, gift of desperation. At one point, I had said it was determination, the gift of determination, but now I believe it's the gift of defeat because it wasn't until I was able to surrender and fully like commit to this program that I was able to really move forward with my with the changes that come with sobriety. And so um, 
you know, a couple months ago, I had discovered that, you know, water was my big, my higher power because, you know, the world is made up of lots of water. Our bodies are made of lots of water. And so I was like, okay, that and everything needs water. I said, okay, so maybe that can be, you know, my higher power. But then um, a couple, last week actually, I had come across this book, Spiritual Awakenings, Journey of the Spirit. It's AA literature. I think it's just a combination of the great finds on spirituality. And I can't find it right now, but um, I remember one of the first things I opened up the book and read was, if God is small enough to be understood by me if, if God is small enough for me to understand him then he's not big enough to deal with my problems and so you know that you know having lots of problems I that was something that I came to terms with and I think now I'm able to just give it up and be open to what he has to offer and so just being open and you know I think also the fellowship, just people being there, being able to reach out and people supporting me has been really helpful. And I've also heard in the rooms that you can't receive the message if you don't show up. And I've been fortunate enough to where I just keep coming back no matter how many times that I go out. And, you know, even though I'm not always doing everything perfectly, you know, it's for progress, not perfection. And I've definitely seen progress in my life, um, definitely understanding this disease more, and I don't think I could have gotten this far without these words. So thank you all for being here, and thank you for listening to my show. My name is Mick. I'm an alcoholic. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad everybody's here. Um, I'm really glad everybody's here. I, if it's one thing that I love, is alcoholics and others. You know, I've been um, I've been here for a little while, and and uh, the people that I've met over the years have been the greatest gifts that uh, that I could have. You know, I have a great family. You know, I uh, but the friends in AA um, have really been uh, the people who've held me together for the time that I've been here. There's this pamphlet called A Member's Eye View of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got in this thing a while ago where I read something at the beginning and then I read something at the end. And um, because I love this pamphlet. It was written by a guy in 1970 who was a teacher at UCLA. And he was teaching professionals about Alcoholics Anonymous. And he wrote this pamphlet called A Member's Eye View of Alcoholics Anonymous. And on page 20, it says, the house that AA helps a man build for himself is different for each occupant because each occupant is his own architect. For many AAs, it's kind of going home, a return, like the prodigal son to the house of his faith and the faith of his fathers. To others, it's a never-ending journey into lands which they did not dream existed. It does not matter which group one falls. What is really important is that AA has more than demonstrated that the house it builds can accommodate the rebel as well as the conformist, the radical as well as the conservative, the agnostic as well as the believer. The absence of formalized dogma, the lack of rules, commandments, nonspecific nature of its definition, and the flexibility of its framework, all these things have thus far considered contribute to the incredible and happy end. And that's what AA has been for me. Um... I guess I could go back. Um, I come from a fairly large family. It was 11 total, but there was four older stepbrothers who never lived with us. Um, But it was seven children. There's three older ones, and then there's a four-year gap, and then there's me, and then there's a a three-and-a-half-year gap, and there's three more. So the older ones didn't want to play with me, and I didn't want to play with the younger ones. So I spent a lot of time by myself. You know, I... uh, when I look back on it, my childhood wasn't that bad, considering I was raised out in East Oakland on 65th, not too far from East 14th, so it could be bad. Um, but it wasn't as bad as uh, as Eddie Joe, who lived down the street. Um, and, and, you know, I was thinking the other day, I acted out since I was a kid. I struggled. My school was eight blocks from the house. 
eight blocks. I couldn't make it home every day without putting my hand in somebody's wet cement, breaking a window, stealing somebody's pigeons, stealing some low cuts off somebody's tree. You know, and back then, Miss Jenkins would bust you, and she'd give you a whooping, and she'd call your mother. So you were going to get another whooping when you got home. Um, but I did this almost every day. You know, I just acted out. And my parents were alcoholics. Father worked the same job for 37 years, um, went to work pretty much every day, and then drank every night. And my mother drank every night. And they'd have these knockdown, fallout fights. Um, but we always had a roof. There was always a car. There was always food. You got something on your birthday. You got something for Christmas. And to me, you know, life was pretty good. Um, I took my first drink when I was 15. Me and a couple of my buddies got somebody to buy us a fifth of vodka um, out near uh, Allen Temple. And it's an elementary school back there. And so we get back there and we drink the whole thing. And uh, I got sick. I vomited. And I drink like that until the day I stopped. You know, if I was at the party, eventually there was going to be vomit somewhere. You know, if I was in your car, eventually I was going to vomit in your car or on you. You know, it was just my M.O. You know, I drink in excess and I never cared. I just didn't care. I had a lot of fun. You know, in the beginning, everything was fine. And you know, there was a lot of drugs involved. And and um, and then things just started going south. You know, um, <laughs> I ended up getting married, and that lasted for a very short time. Um, and I had this great job. Um, I got this job as a fireman, and I worked three days on, four days off. And my captain would um, would say, "You got four days to get here, and you're late." You know, and um, and I'd say, "Hey, traffic was real bad." You know? And, and um, you know, and and I was drinking and using, and you know. On a job where you really don't have to do much, <laughs> especially since I worked in Pebble Beach, there was no fires. Um, we had what was called pickup and putbacks. The rich people down there would fall off their toilet, and we'd have to go down and pick them up and put them back on the toilet. And that was that was pretty much the extent of the job. Um, but I was a uh, I was loaded all the time, you know, and. And so, you know, things kept going on, and and through a series of bad breaks and misunderstandings, <laughs> we ended up parting ways after several years um, and came to an agreement that I really wasn't suited for that work. Um, and it's difficult to lose a civil service job. You know, it's really difficult. The one thing that I know, in retrospect, everybody's a genius, you know, in hindsight, but um, the one thing I know is that if you don't go to work, they will fire you. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of what happened. Um, but I had fun while I was doing it. And after that, things just kept getting a little worse and a little worse. You know, I was um, had a bunch of other little jobs here and there, and I'm living with my mother. And at this point, I would my mother had changed. Something had happened. And I would take her to this place on 47th, and East 14th and drop her off and then an hour and a half later I'd pick her up and I didn't know what, where she was going you know she was just different um, and what happened is she had got sober and she never said a word about me um, or any of the other family members they're drinking they're using you know she was just taking care of herself and she was great you know she went to school ended up getting her degree you know, it was it was amazing, you know, and I didn't see any of that until I got here. Um, so what happens is that I'm um, I'm living there and and things are pretty bad at this point. So she leaves the house to um, to go visit my sister in Sacramento and I ran out of money. So I figured I'd sell a couple of pieces of furniture. <laughs> um, so I took some stuff out. I put it on the lawn. You know, of course, it was twenty dollars. Everything was twenty dollars, and um, and I sold the living room stuff, and then the dining room stuff, and then the bedroom stuff, and uh, pretty much the house was close to empty um, over a weekend. And so I left because I didn't want to be there when she got back. Um, and 
she was uh, in the program and she wrote me a note. That's all she ever said about the whole thing. And the note said, I don't know what your problem is, but whatever it is, it's starting to affect other people's lives. That's all she ever said about the whole thing. I couldn't stay there anymore, you know. They were, <laughs> that option was off the table at that point. Um, but so now, you know, I'm bouncing around, I'm couch surfing, I'm pretty much homeless. But I'm doing what I got to do. Every morning I get up, find me some money, you know, go get loaded. And, um, you know, as things started to get worse, I got no place to stay now. So now I'm just walking the streets. I'm homeless. I'm sleeping in the San Francisco bus station at times, you know, here, there, you know. Um, you know, I, I recall walking down to some, some stupid stories. I recall walking down East 14th near 38th, and I, um, I look in the window, and there's this guy in there with this woman's coat on. And it's like powder blue. It's got fur around the collar. And I'm like, well, shit, I'm not that bad. Um, and yeah, I kept staring at him. And I realized it was a reflection of me in the window. And, you know, that's, and a light bulb came on. Now, it didn't stay on, but it came on, you know. Um, and, you know, so things continue to go. And, you know, I, um, I got nothing. I got nothing. You know, I got, I'm walking around with a pair of biker's pants, a disco shirt with the flyaway collar, and a pair of rock ports with the Velcro on. You know, this is my life. And, um, and you know, what I did is I, I went to a meeting um, with my sister. But you guys were bad. <laughs> you know, I, I wasn't nearly as bad as you guys, you know. And, and my mother used to tell this story about, um, about an alcoholic who had cirrhosis of the liver and he died. And, uh, and she asked the woman, well, why didn't he go to AA? And she said, oh, he wasn't that bad. Um, so, um, you know, I, uh, so I kept, you know, piddling around and, and, uh, and I'm in the San Francisco bus station one night and, and, you know, I, and of course I'm better than the people over there. And, and I said, uh, you know, it's bad enough I have to sleep with two people, but now you're hogging the bench. <laughs> and the guy said, you're one of us people. And another light bulb came on, you know, didn't stay on, but it came on, you know. And so I started going to meetings and um, and I was doing the best I could. And, you know, the, the funny thing about AA is that if you stick around, you get to know people. There's a couple of people in this room who probably know me better than I know me, you know, and I tell my stuff and they kind of look at me and they're okay, sure, Mick, you know, um, but they know the real Mick. Um, and so I get here and, and I'm going to the meetings down at Laney College and, and uh, Daryl F. was the secretary and I raised my hand one time and he said, you don't need to raise your hand, we know you're a newcomer. I was so embarrassed because I was sitting in front you know, everybody would clap when you were a newcomer. It was cool, you know, and but I was so embarrassed. How could he do that to me? And of course, another bulb came on um, and went off quickly. Um, so by this time, I'm this close to being a match boy in a gay crack house. Um, and it, it was it was pretty bad. And so I'm I am um, I leave this house to go get some more. And um, and I get across the street and I look at this house and something comes to my body and says, you don't have to do this anymore. And I don't know what it was. I never put a label on it, but it wasn't me. And um, I walked to Mandana house. I raised my hand for 30 days and I haven't had to raise it since. And that was April 10th, 1989. And um, and that's when the fun started. You know, um, when I got there, the reason... What, what got me there is that first meeting really kind of set a tone for me is when I got there was a guy speaking and he had a drug problem and he had ran out of matches. So he had lit his grandmother's bathroom rug on her stove to light his pipe. And I was like, damn, I like this guy, you know, and, um, and, and I wanted to come back and hear some more stories, you know, and, and there were people there, you know, it was like Brent J and, and Mike B, you know, and, and Jerome and, and, um, and Rafiki, you know, and, and these people were, 
where they are in, to me, and I know Brent said it, but to me it appeared like they didn't want to have anything to do with me. And Brent flat out told me, he said, you're pathetic. He said, you're not serious. This is life and death, and you will die out there. He said, and when you get serious, then you'll know what I'm talking about. I kept coming back every day. You know, I'd go to meetings. Basically, I was unemployed or unemployable, so it wasn't like I had, you know, something to do. Um, and so I'm going to these meetings, and and, uh, and I meet a guy named um, Freeman G, and, and I asked him to sponsor me. And Freeman one of the, was one of the last people in the United States to have a jerry curl. And, <laughs> and, uh, and he had this... Uh, this gold he used to wear like this Mr. T starter kit, um, you know, all this cheap gold. And, and um, but I asked him to sponsor me because he had this medallion that said "Screw guilt," and he and I walk around. I was so ashamed of myself at this point. I walk around with my head down, and I, um, you know, I just and he said, "Fake it. If you don't feel good, act like you feel good. Hold your head up, you know." And um, and he said, "Screw guilt." And so, you know, for uh, about a month or two or whatever, you know, I hung out. And, and then I was at the Rapid Noon, and I, uh, I heard this guy speak. And he said, there's nothing wrong with you. You're perfect just the way you are. And I could resonate with that. And, you know, my story included things like, you know, um, I lived in a house where I had sheets over the curtains. I had a two by four up against the back door, um, you know, the knob. I had broken the key off in the front door so nobody could get in, although I was the only one who had a key. Um, and I'd climb out the window. My life had been reduced to that. Um, it was bad. You know, I, I, I remember leaving a party in San Francisco after vomiting on the guy's deck. And uh, so I snuck out the back and it was in the marina. And I remember the car was real hot. And I was like, why is it so hot in here? I was on Park Boulevard in 580. I had blacked out all the way from the marina to Oakland. And I was driving in third gear at 65 miles an hour. That's why the car was so hot. Um, but, so these are the kind of things that I would do. And I just keep doing the same thing over and over again like it was going to change. When she was reading that stuff about change to this, change to that, try this, try that. I did all that. It always turned out the same. Nothing ever changed. And I get here and this gentleman said that because I would beat myself up so much. And he said that we beat ourselves up enough while we were out there. We don't need to do that while we're in here. And so I asked him, could I talk to him? And he said, sure, my office is around the corner. He's an attorney in Oakland. And I uh, went around there and I said, um, you know, would you sponsor me? He said, yeah. I said, what do you want me to do? He said, what do you mean? I said, does you want me to do something? He said, I don't care what you do. <laughs> he said, here's what you don't do. Don't call me after 8 p.m. unless you got a drink in your hand. And I said, well, I don't understand. He said, well, I go to sleep early. I get up early. And, you know, if you got a drink in your hand, give me a call. And I said, what if I don't feel good? He said, then you just don't feel good. He said, if you call me after 8 p.m., I'm not going to feel good. Uh, he said, you, you'll be all right. Just sit with it. And so the guy is named David S., and he's still my sponsor. It's been 29 years. Next month will be 29 years. And um, David's sponsor was a guy named Earl, <laughs> whose uh, story's in the big book, Physician Heal Thyself. And so Earl was retired. Dave was self-employed. And I was unemployable. So all we had to do was hang out, you know. And so that's what we did, you know. I'd hang out with them and, and Nancy O, you know, and... And, and, and all these people who had been around a long time and, and I'm still going to the meetings in Oakland and Brent one day says to me, Hey man, um, why don't we hang out? He says, but I need to go buy you some clothes because I can't be seen with you the way you're dressed. <laughs> Brent had everything that I used to have. He had suits, he had a new car, he had his own place. He had a girlfriend. These are, you know, these are things that I had lost, um, 
and didn't look like I was going to get them back because when I got here, I thought that you guys were going to get me all my stuff back. <laughs> I wanted a job. I wanted a place to stay. I wanted a car, and I wanted a girl. And Freeman told me, we can't give you any of that. What I can promise you is that if you don't drink, you won't get drunk. <laughs> and I was like, well, yeah, just don't drink. And there was another lady who said to me, I asked her, how do you do this? And she said, just don't drink right now, and it's always right now. <laughs> and that made sense. And that's what I did. Now, ever since that day that I walked out of that house, I've never had an urge to drink or use anything. The way I feel about that is a whole different ball game. Um, but with the people that I've been around, you know, um, I was able to to become my own person, to think for myself. Um, you know, Dave and I, we'd hang out and, and, um, and, you know, we started doing the steps. And I remember when, um, when I did my fourth step, I, I had this list, a book, you know, I went with the columns and everything. And, uh, it was a hundred people who, who had screwed over me. And he said, well, why don't you revisit that? And, um, you know, just keep working on it. And, um, uh, so a few months passed and those names shifted from they screwed over to me to actually screwed over them, you know. Um, and so I remember when I sat down with him to do my fifth step, um, I started reeling off these atrocities that I had done. And he said, well, there, there's a bunch of good things about you, you know, don't beat up on yourself. He says, if you want to beat up on yourself, there's a two by four out of the garage. You're welcome to it. <laughs> and, um. What had bothered me the most, I had done a lot of skanky stuff my whole life. And I broke down in tears when I got to the part where I had chucked and jived my whole life and lied and manipulated and, um, and just got away with stuff. I just kept getting away with it. And that's why I kept doing what I was doing, because I kept getting away with it. And I had never been aware of that until I wrote this stuff down, you know. Um, so we did that, and and we're hanging out, and and uh, you know, Earl, you know, he's um, he's giving me his little spills. He he hung out with Bill a lot, so he'd always tell me these stories about he and Bill. So and and the way you feel, and then Earl's philosophy, which which you know, I've come to to um, accept over the uh, years is that I can't change the way I feel. Physically, I can do things, but the way I feel fluctuates all the time. I'll get up in the morning and I'm leaving the house. Everything's cool. Ten minutes later, I want to drive off the bridge. I don't know what happened. You know, five minutes later, everything's cool. I've come to grips with I can't change the way I feel. And so what I do is I just go through the day and I put one foot in front of the other. And Earl would tell me that emotionally you're screwed and that physically you can do things. If you want to go to Hawaii, you might want to buy a plane ticket, um, you know. Um, but how you feel about going to Hawaii is a whole different ballgame. And he said, once you realize that you're screwed, then you're okay. So every day I go through all these emotions about how I feel about people, about things, about me. And I understand that they just come and go. But the one thing that I've done over all this period of time is I've never taken a drink, you know. Because when I look back on it, my mother didn't get me drunk. You know, Captain Marlowe never got me drunk. Eddie Joe didn't even get me drunk. I got me drunk. Alcohol got me drunk. That's what happened. And I was talking this morning in a meeting is that, is that Brent would tell me to keep my recovery right in front of my face, make it the most important thing in my life, put everything behind it. Because once you lose that, you're going to lose all that other stuff. And I'm, I was talking about, I'm not the guy who's going to come in and say, hey, three weeks from now, I'm going to get drunk. Two weeks from now, I'm going out. Tomorrow's the day. I'm going to do it. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to come in. They're going to ask for newcomers. I'm going to raise my hand. Everybody's going to go, what happened? I'm an alcoholic. And you put a drink in front of me, and I'm subject to drink it. 
So I keep my recovery right in front of my face. And, and that's the kind of message that I've been getting over all the years. Dave, he's never once told me what to do. Never. You know, he, he'll say things like, because um, he was talking this morning, and he said that uh, you probably should tell a couple of stories that's happened, you know, since you've been in recovery. And I was like, oh, yeah, he says, yeah, like, um, you know, when you were about 12 years sober and you were carrying a gun around in your car, you had a, you know, a Glock under the seat. And um, so I'm driving around and it's for protection. Well, who's after me? Um, so I'm driving around and, and, um, and I'm sober, you know, I think I am. And and I uh, I'm up here by Kaiser Hospital, and I cut a guy off, and I apologize. Hey, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, the guy won't let it go, so I I pull away, and he pulls up next to me. I'm like, yeah, it's cool, it's cool, cool. So then I figure I got to turn. So I turn, get out of his way. He follows me. So we get to the next light. I'm right in front of Kaiser Hospital. He's going crazy. You don't know where I am. Blah blah blah. I reach under the seat, pow, slap the gun on the dashboard. The guy in the car next to us looked and went through the red light. <laughs> you know. And this guy looks at me, and it dawned on me, what are you doing? What are you doing? And so I tell Dave about it. He says, boy, that's even a stretch for you, Mick. You know, um, because I've done some things since I've been here that just don't make any sense. You know, but one thing that I haven't done is take a drink. You know, and as a result of that, I'm able to look at me on a daily basis. You know, Earl would um would tell me to get with the program. Because he'd say, you're a little off base. You might want to get with the program. That's not how this thing works, Mick. You know, you, you can't have multiple girlfriends in the program unless they know about it. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, these are the kind of things that I would do. So as time passes, you know, um, I've, I've come to... My younger brother, this is a sad thing. My younger brother has 10 more days than me. Really pisses me off. You know, I, I talk to him, I ask him a question, he'll say, look, newcomer, you know. You, you, and, uh, but um, you talk about being able to think for yourself. So he had this psycho sponsor, this guy named David A. in Sacramento. And David would talk crazy to him. You need to shut up and mind your own business. What has that got to do with you? You know, sit your newcomer self down and take care of yourself. So you just talk crazy to him. And Blake would be like, okay, okay, okay. So up there they give out cakes. So Blake is giving out the cakes. And he says to David, hey, I don't think that guy's as sober as he says he is. I gave him a cake a while ago. And David says, what has that got to do with you? You need to mind your own business. Maybe he just likes cake. <laughs> you know, and, and that's what it is, is. I've learned in this program that there's a million ways to do it. And it doesn't bother me how people do their program. I'm only concerned with people staying sober. You know, I just want us to become this community of people I think I've gotten better over the years. There's probably some people in this room who would say I haven't seen much improvement. Um, but uh, but I'm just concerned with the people in the rooms and that we're kind to one another, you know, that we support one another, you know, that that somebody's there when people come in the rooms. Maceo did this meeting in West Oakland. Maceo's a different character. you got to know him to, to appreciate him. Um, and nobody ever came to his meeting. Six months. Nobody. So I popped in there, and I said, what are you doing, man? Nobody comes. And he says, he says, I want to be here in case somebody comes, because somebody was here when I came. And that's what it is with me, is that I want to be here when somebody comes, because I can't imagine what would have happened that day when I walked from that place to Mandana House and nobody would have been there. I can't imagine what would have happened, you know. And over this period of time, you know, I've, uh, you know, D Dave, you know, um, 
I've come to know a guy who loves me no matter what. In 1990, Dave bought a Lexus when they first came out. And brand new. And he asked me to go pick it up with him. And he drove that Lexus for the longest. He had 470,000 miles on this Lexus. And um, he loved that car. And and so, you know, I go out and house sit and all this stuff. And, and um, so I'm out there. He's playing golf in Arizona somewhere. And I'm all sitting and, uh, and you know, I'm doing stuff. And, and uh, I totaled the car. And, um, well, to this day, he never asked me if I was hurt. Um, but, uh, <laughs> he did tell me that no matter what you do, no matter what happens, I will always love you just the way you are. And it's just stuff. And um, he, he was trying to get to a half million miles. And, and I, as a result of what I did, um, that didn't happen. Um, but um, that's the kind of people that I've been around in this program. People who love me in spite of me. People who give of themselves. You know, people who have no problem getting up in the middle of the night to go help somebody. These are the kind of people that I've come to know, you know, and, and, and there's people who talk about what they do for people. I really don't like talking much about what I do for people. I like hearing about what people do for people. Um, you know, I, um, I'm going to, um, Dave, Dave's getting older and you know, I've, I've been thinking if, um, and I don't know what, I'm an atheist. So, you know, I, I doubt I'm going, I'm going someplace. I don't know where it is. I got friends in both places. So, uh, <laughs> so I, uh, you know, I think about that, um, since nobody gets out of this alive, um, you know, I think about if something happens to Dave, you know, you know, and, and if I'm ever asked, you know, when, when I go, you know, what would you have done or what would you have liked to done to do? And I know that I would like spending five more minutes with Dave if, if I had an option, you know, that's what I'd like. Um, because I've never met anybody who cared as much about me. Um, just because I'm an alcoholic, you know, um, I, I just, I've never experienced anything like this, you know, and I, um, so, so I'm going to read this and, and shut up. Um, is it time for you to shut up? No, uh, not yet. Oh, wow. Yes. Ten more minutes. <laughs> I can start lying. Um, no, <laughs> no, I, um, you know, the, the program and, and the people, you know, you, you look at Michael, you look at, at Holly, you know, you look at Norman, you look at Connie, you know, it's, you know, you got Aaron. It's it's people who keep me alive every day. When when I leave the house every day, I take a little bit of AA with me everywhere I go, you know, because I run into these situations where I've always had resentments against people, you know. They do this better than me, you know. Why can't I do this? Why wasn't I this? And, and like I said, everybody's a genius in hindsight, you know. But but I look back on my life, and since I've been here, I've had a pretty charmed life. A pretty charmed life. I ended up marrying this woman a couple of years in the program, and she had a couple of small children. And I raised those children up till they went to college. Now, we're divorced, and the kids don't speak to me anymore. That's a whole different story. Um, but that was one of the greatest experiences, you know, that I've had, and that was only as a result of being an Alcoholics Anonymous. This thing has given me something that I couldn't imagine. I walk through my day knowing that I can get through anything, anything, without taking a drink, without taking a hit, without slapping a gun on the dashboard, you know, without cussing people out. I can get through the day if I look back on what I learned here. You know, um, I, I'd i like to say that I've done everything right, um, and I probably haven't, 
But what I have done, I'm proud of. You know, what I have done, I'm proud of. And, you know, I, I go to meetings out at the hut in Lafayette, and if you ever get a chance to come out to the hut, it's probably one of the greatest places you could go. It doesn't matter who you are, what you do, what you believe in. Just want you to come to that. You know, that's it. You know, and, and I, um, you know, over the period of time that I've been here, I've, I've been through some, you know, some changes. Um, you know, I was in this, uh, that marriage for 17 years and that thing dissolved. And, um, you know, my family, um, supported me through the whole thing. You know, my friends in AA supported me through the whole thing. You know, my, um, my life as a result of being here, as opposed to being out there. Um, because I still look at people out there. There was a guy who, um, I remember when I was new, it was a guy who, cause when you're new, you want to tell everybody how to get sober. Um, so there's a guy at the liquor store and, um, and I go by there every day and ask me for change. And so I'm going to get him sober. So I said, Hey man, you don't have to live like this. Let me tell you my story. <laughs> and he's, looking, he's looking at me like what? And uh, I said, you know, you don't have to drink like this. He said, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm a heroin addict, and don't be questioning my lifestyle. <laughs> so, so, you know, <laughs> what happens is that AA, you know, made me think that I could change people's lives. And there's nothing I can say to you that will keep you sober, and there's nothing I can say to you that will get you drunk. You know, nothing, you know, what, what worked for me is that for the first time in my life, I was able to come and listen to somebody other than me. And at times I still struggle with that and it's okay. It's okay. You know, I, um, I think that, uh, that if you get an opportunity to experience this thing, you know, to its fullest extent, if you get an opportunity to travel and see how we do this other places because I'll go to meetings in other places and go, oh my God, they're doing it wrong, you know. And um, they're not; they're doing what they do, and maybe they just like cake, you know. That's what it really boils down to, you know. So, um, at the end of this pamphlet, the guy writes, "This coming Sunday in the churches of many of us, there will be read that portion of the Gospel of Matthew which recounts the time when John the Baptist." was languishing in the prison of Herod. And hearing the works of his cousin Jesus, he sent two of his disciples to him to say, Art thou he is to come, or shall we look for another? And Christ did as he so often did. He did not answer them directly, but wanted John to decide for himself. And so he said to the disciples, Go and report to John what you have heard and what you have seen. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead rise, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Back in my childhood catechism days, I was taught that the poor in this instance did not only mean the poor in material sense, but also meant the poor in spirit, those who burn with an inner hunger and an inner thirst, and that the word gospel meant quite literally the good news. More than 16 years ago, four men, my boss, my physician, my pastor, and the one friend I had left working singly and together maneuvered me into AA. Tonight, if they were to ask me, tell us what did you find? I would say to them what I say to you now. I can only tell you what you have heard, what I've heard and seen. It seems the blind do see, the lame do walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead rise, and over and over again, in the middle of the longest day of the darkest night, the poor in spirit have the good news told to them. God grant that it may always be so. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.